Hey everybody, this is Rustin Rose with Metalholic Magazine, and with me today, the ever-lovely and talented ghoulish metal mistress, Margarita Monet from Edge of Paradise. How are you doing? Thank you, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, I'm glad that we could connect and talk about your new project. So I have to ask, how did you go from a little girl in Armenia to being a pianist in Russia to a young girl in Texas dreaming of being an actress to a head-banging front woman in Los Angeles? <laughs> oh, I, have, I ask myself that every single day. <laughs> but, um, you know, I mean, my whole life I've been kind of traveling. And, uh, you know, it, I've always been involved in music. And I started as a classical pianist. Um, and then, you know, we moved to Houston, Texas, and it was a huge change, so I had to kind of adjust. And um, I went to performing arts high school, and, you know, I, I always knew that I wanted to be a performer. It's just, you know, it's like different kinds of performers. And classical pianist to an actor and to a singer of a metal band, you know, it's um, it's very, very different. But at the same time, it's still, you know, it's, uh, it's all entertainment in some right. way. So, um, yeah, and, you know, I wanted to be an actress. Um, well, I decided to move to New York to pursue acting, and I went to college there for acting. And I also I kept playing piano as well. And then um, someone told me that I should move to L.A., like this agent. And so I moved to L.A. to pursue acting. And then, you know, there's a lot of waiting around for that to go. And you know, it's not the same, you know, it's not like the that glorious thing people think of, you know, when they... <laughs> come to Hollywood to be an actor. So, um, and you know, I really missed music because it's always been part of my life. And uh, I got this opportunity, and I, you know, I met Dave, and we just started this band, and everything just like fell into, you know, the right place. You know, and it's just, like, and now I feel like this is like what I'm supposed to be doing, and everything just led up to this moment. Now, going back, though, was there an album or a song, uh, something like that, that sort of changed your life that really led you into music? Yes, I mean, into rock music, definitely. When I heard Led Zeppelin, I instantly, like, you know, I love, I still love Led Zeppelin, it's one of my favorite bands. Um, I really love that one song, uh, Cashmere. Right. Remember that song uh, was a big impact, you know, because I was used to um, listening to classical music, you know, my whole childhood, and um, I think, uh, you know, it's definitely it, it has like a melodic quality to it, so I could really relate to that. And then, you know, also um, I found out about Black Sabbath and Ronnie James Dio, and from then on, you know, I just fell in love with all that Iron Maiden, Metallica. Your voice, to me, when you sing, has almost an old-school, almost a punkish attitude to it. It's a little bit different than a lot of the female-fronted bands we hear these days. Who were your vocal inspirations, besides Ronnie James Dio, of course, because I know he had to be one of them, but who inspired you <laughs> vocally? Well, um, both Robert Plant and Ro uh, Ronnie James Dio, I think you know both of them had a big influence on the way I sing because I just listened to, um, you know, the those bands for you know, a, a lot. And um, also I used to listen to Queen a lot. You know, um, Freddie Mercury, I think, that was a bit of an influence on me. Uh, but definitely, you know, I just listened to a lot of male-fronted bands. So I think that's why... Um, you hear that sort of style in my voice, you know, I never really listened to um, Evanescence or Nightwish, you know, because those are more um, operatic kind of kind of singing, you know, so um, I definitely think like that what I listened to had a big influence on me that way. Right. So give us some backstory on Edge of Paradise. How did you come to meet Dave Bates and, and get involved in the project? Well, um, when I was out here, I met a producer who convinced me to record a song with him, and it was more of a, a pop rock song. Which, you know, I never, I knew it could never work out because I wasn't really passionate about pop or pop 
rock, you know. Um, and uh, But we needed a guitar player to do some parts, so we um, found Dave. He was doing a recital in a music store, and so we asked him to play guitar in the song. And it was pretty funny, actually, because when the producers started mixing the song, you could not hear guitars at all. <laughs> you know, like, they were completely buried. So, I mean, that's how me and Dave kind of met, because we had a similar vision that we wanted the music to be like. And um, Dave was looking for a singer as well, and he had a lot of uh, material left over from a previous band, and also he's been working on songs for a very, very long time. So, um, you know, he asked if I wanted to sing on his stuff, and we just formed Edge of Paradise like two weeks after we met. And the debut album, Mask, to my ear, sonically has a modern power metal feel tinged with sort of some industrial and punk elements. Is that sort of how you see it, or, or do you have a different feel for how the music sounds? Yes, you know, I think um, you summed it up about right, because you know, it, w- it was really difficult for us at first, um, because, you know, these days, sometimes people, when they hear metal, um, they think of you know, thrash or death metal, but... So we started calling ourselves straight off just heavy metal because, um, you know, our influences include you know, the founding fathers of metal, like you know, Black Sabbath, Iron Maiden, Metallica. And, um, so, but we did want to put a modern twist on it. And um, it was really cool when we were recording Mask is to, um, you know, find that that sound that we wanted I just Paradise to be. And uh, there was a lot of experimenting and, you know, trying things out. And, um, but, you know, it, it's still the whole foundation of, of this music was based on, you know, the classic heavy metal. Right. And, of course, because a lot of this stuff was already done prior to you getting involved in the project, my guess is, as you guys spend more time together, by the time we get to the second Edge of Paradise album, we'll sort of see an evolution into what you guys really ultimately are going to sound like long term. Yes. Yes, we're actually working on some new stuff right now, and um, we're going to release a single by the end of the year, so I think that song would really kind of, you know, um, represent the sound of Edge of Paradise. Now, you've got some very special guest musicians on the record. Bjorn Englund, Greg Bissonette, Tony Franklin, Robin McCauley. How did that all come about? Yes, uh, well, uh, Dave, you know, from his previous band's lead, um, he, Robin McCauley was the front man. And, uh, but before, I know he met Tony at a clinic in Santa Monica. They were both um, playing at a clinic in a music store. And... Um, you know, he asked Tony if you know he wanted to do some songs because all the songs uh, originally started out as instrumentals or you know as guitar jams, and then he met Tony and Greg, and they recorded some stuff just you know straight off instrumental. And then uh, when he met Flavin, uh, you know they formed Bleed, and they started to rework the songs, um, you know, to become you know, vocal songs and. I mean, the song just went through so much evolution, you know. Um, and Bjorn, uh, Dave and Bjorn been friends for a very long time. They went to um, Musicians Institute together, and they were in Robin's band previously doing Michael Shanker stuff. So, and, you know, it's a small world, so everybody kind of knows everybody, especially out in L.A. So, um, you know, it just they were kind of just got together and, did some songs together and it evolved, evolved into you know, songs in Fleet and now um, they evolved into songs in Edge of Paradise. Nice. I, I noticed uh, you guys did a take on Edgar Winter's uh, Frankenstein, Shredenstein, and Dave <laughs> just tears it up on that. What, uh, <laughs> yeah. what made you guys decide to throw that on there? Well, um, first, we, you know, we, wanted, we kind of rushed into releasing the album because we wanted to solidify the band, and, um, you know, if you're a band, you have to have something to show for, and uh, we have, we had all of these, you know, songs around, so we wanted to, you know, put, put them together in a coherent way, but also to kind of represent the band, because the band is, uh, you know, the guitar is such a big part of this band, you know, because of Dave, and he's a songwriter, and also, you know, the guitar is a 
very strong element in all the songs. And Frankenstein is, um, you know, I mean, it's just such a cool remake. He did that before I came into the picture. And, you know, I heard it and I was like, <laughs> but, you know, it's a, it, like he took it to like the heavy metal, you know, the version of it. So I thought it was really cool. And, and why not throw it on the album and just, you know, showcase what, what you know, the elements of this band. Because, um, you know, it, this album kind of, you know, it, it wasn't really like this band came together and we just went into writing the new songs. It came together out of, you know, the past of Dave and then, um, you know, the and I came into the band and you know, I put my own twist on things. But I think Frankenstein was a really cool representation of what Dave can do with his guitar. So, and it's a cool track, you know, people recognize it. And now it's Halloween, so, <laughs> you know, it's a cool Halloween track as well. So Right, I noticed you know, you're giving it away free on your website right now. Yeah, uh-huh. Yes, so. we are. Um, speaking of the guitars, it, you guys are very guitar heavy, uh, which is absolutely wonderful, but Dave's the only guitar player in the band. How do you pull that off live when you have such a wall of guitars? Yeah, I mean, he got it all figured out. He has a huge um, rig that he, you know, chalice to shows with. Um, but, you know, he, he somehow he manages to recreate that sound. I know he runs stuff through um, two different amps, and so he uh, he can recreate that wall of guitars, you know. But we also use because um, like, uh, I don't, you know, some people they don't notice it, but the keyboards are throughout all the songs, and they're mostly Rob Zombie keyboards, you know, they give it like a Rob Zombie uh, feel to it, and they're all very basic, basic keyboards that just support the guitars. Right. You can hear you can kind of hear them and we breathe because they're more symphonic sounding. But you know we also ha in a live show we have those keyboards kind of supporting that wall of sound. But you know the we do have one guitar player and he, and he handles it, so it's been good so far. Mm -hmm. Now the songs were were basically done when you joined the band. Did you write the lyrics on any of them? You know, and where do you draw your lyrical inspirations from? Well, um, the songs though, were done before, but we changed them. We changed a lot of it, you know, around. So um, a lot of the lyrics were um, rewritten. Some of them stayed exactly the same, like walk, walk the line and thrown it all away. Um, falling down, um, I most of the lyrics. And um, on that song, uh, you know, um, I drew it some, I mean, you know, it's kind of like about the... You know, the end of the world, you know, then people get it from there, but it's also um, more about, like, the, you know, the change, change in the world. So, um, you know, I draw it from what's happening now, you know, what, what people are saying, what, what's, what's going around the world, you know, what's, what's the most, um, because, you know, it's, a, it's such a mysterious time that we live in, you know, there's so many different um, you know, theories and stories about like, 2012, or, you know, what have you, you know. Right. Um, so yeah, I just thought, why not play on that stuff, you know. So I kind of drew it from that whole idea. Um, but also, you know, like the you know the title track, Mask, Brian Jones is the co-writer on it. And before I, I joined the band, the song was called To Believe. And... It was, uh, it was in a, I mean, it was about the drummer in the previous band that ended his life with a suicide. So the whole song kind of rose from the, you know, the Dave and Brian when they were feeling, because both of them knew the band. So it was, it was very strange for them. And because the guy, you know, he never showed any signs of depression or anything. You know, he was always happy and, gave everybody else advice, so it kind of came out of nowhere, so I know they were dealing with it when they wrote the song, and when I read the lyrics, you know, there was nothing, no, I mean, nothing that said about a mask, but when you were reading the lyrics, you know, it was so obvious that the song was about the mask that people wear, you know, and everywhere, like, especially in L.A., you know, it's, like, it's very hard to 
um, come across somebody who opens themselves up completely to you. So you never really know what's happening behind, you know, behind the mask. And, um, you know, to me it was so obvious in that song. So, uh, I, you know, it was like, why not kind of um, highlight that part of the whole album? Because it's so prominent in this environment. So we kind of wanted to, you know, talk about that more. It's, it's, and it's very relatable to people. Right, absolutely. Now, I know you guys are doing a lot of shows around the L.A. area, um, and I believe you guys are going to gear up to do a bigger tour sometime in 2012? Yes. Um, yeah, we've been playing a lot of local shows around. Um, we are. We might have a show up in New York at the end of the year, um, but we are going on the U.S. tour in the beginning of 2012. So, um, yeah, I know we're just going to kind of hit the road and try to take this music to the people. Right. Now, music has changed so much in the last two decades, um, especially the music business as a whole. These days, you have to be a master of social media. How do you guys handle that, and how much direct connection do you have with the fans? Yes, I mean, that's such an important part now. You know, it's a blessing and a curse in some ways, but, I mean, you can reach so, so many people from all over the world, but at the same time, Internet is so saturated, you know, so you have to make sure you stand out. And, um, you know, I had to figure out a way to kind of keep up with all social media. And you know, Facebook is such a huge part now. And Because, you know, MySpace used to be big. So it's like, well, you have a MySpace page, you have a Facebook page, you have everything, you know. So, um, you know, I tried to sort of, I wanted to kind of put ourselves um, out there, t you know, so people can at least find us. So um, it was very important to, uh, you know, keep up with, uh, or at least I like, create the pages so, um, you know, people know where to go or when they search for you, you know, you, they find you. So, um, you know, we had to um, make sure all that media is taken care of. And I, th I think it's a really cool thing um, in a way that you can communicate with fans directly because, you know, I, we hear from people that are all the way from Australia, from Mexico, and they're right there. You know, they message you and, you know, they're like, oh, I like your music. So, you know, it's like they discover you. So I think that's a really cool thing about the whole social media thing because everything is, like, laid out there and it's very, you know, it's easy access. But at the same time, you know, it kind of takes away the whole thrill of discovering new music and waiting for that album to come out. Now they can just, like, go to iTunes and download it. Yeah, it definitely makes everything a lot more accessible, especially in this age of instant gratification. We don't want to wait for anything. But, you know, I mean, there's, yeah. there's rabid fans that just literally, they follow every every band that they love. They follow all their Twitter pages. They know what's going on. And in a way, it makes them feel like they're more involved in the band. So I think that's a great thing. There's not that disconnect like we used to have back in the 70s and 80s. But by the same token, there's not any more of these mass, these huge bands like the Metallicas and Led Zeppelins and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. Everything is very, you know, people don't feel it's like right. But I think it's, it kind of sucks because kids, I don't think they'll ever experience that you know, when they're waiting for that one album to come come out and so they can go to record store and have, you know, hold it in their hand or, like, look for it through, you know, search for it through all the other albums. You know, I think that's a, that's a really cool talk about, you know, the whole kind of, like, have that physical thing in your hand. Right. Kind of a different experience, you know. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I had growing up. There's that great loss now where we used to go out and we'd, die to get the, our hands on that physical album then we'd sit there for hours just looking at the artwork reading the lyrics and just you know being immersed in the music um and of course we couldn't just download it all for free and and rob the bands like we do now but um, have, have, have you guys talked about uh it, perhaps not now but uh when a major label picks you guys up releasing mask in vinyl Yes, you know, I mean, we kind of uh, talk about it every day because, you know, we want kind of to not, I mean, we can't really bring it back, you know, but 
it, it would be really cool if we have that kind of physical thing that people, you know, they have. And you know what? From um, other countries, we had we got a lot of, you know, orders. Like people would order the hard copy of the album from, you know, out the U.S. And it seems like overseas, they, you know, they they kind of still like that idea of, you know, the uh, holding the physical copy of the band. Um, but we are, you know, this is what we're working towards, you know, getting attention of a major label. So we do have that, you know, opportunity to release it on vinyl and, you know, to kind of have more power, you know, over people because it it takes such a big financial backing, you know, to do all those things. So we are definitely looking towards all that. Absolutely. So where can people buy the album? They can buy it everywhere, but if you go to our website, which is I just heard it, band.com, all the links are on there. It's on iTunes, it's on Amazon, it's on Loud Tracks. Loud Tracks is a pretty cool thing because it's kind of like iTunes, but only for hard and heavy. You know, they only have rock, punk, and metal on there, so it's pretty cool. It's based out of Canada. And, you know, they can also order it off of our website, and we will send them a, you know, send you a hard copy of the album. Nice. So, basically, edgeofparadiseband.com. You can find all the links for everything, including your Facebook, all of that good stuff. Um, yeah. Last question before we get out of here, then. Today is Halloween. I know you spend most of your time dressed up in one way or another, but... Um, <laughs> What's your, growing up or as an adult, what's your favorite or most unique Halloween costume you've worn? What's the unique costume? I dressed up as um, Edward Scissorhands once. Nice. So pretty, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, I was, a, because in my high school, it was a performing arts high school, so it's like when it's Halloween, people go full out, so you have to be really creative or, or you know, they wouldn't get you in the high school. <laughs> so we all, like, you know, we're, preparing like a month in advance, making our costumes. It was pretty fun. You know, I, I think I looked like Edward Scissorhands. Nice. Margarita Scissorhands. Margarita yeah. Monet of Edge of Paradise, thank you so much for taking the time. We look forward to getting the album out there everywhere, hoping you get signed to a major label soon, and seeing you on the road next year. That will be phenomenal. Um, and, of course, the video, Mask, is already out. You can find it on YouTube, on the website. That had to be a lot of fun to make. Yes, it was. You know, it was a lot of stress getting everything together for the day of shooting because we had a lot of people involved. But it's such a fun project. You know, it's a, it was really awesome on the day of shooting. It was really fun. Anything you, you know, want to... next video... Oh, I was just going to say that our next video is going to be in a spaceship. We've decided that. Yeah, there's a really cool spaceship set. So, <laughs> so we can look forward yeah. to that as well. Last yes. words before we get out of here. Anything you want to say to the fans? I just want to thank everybody for, you know, discovering us and, you know, be a, because we are a little bit different. So be open to the music and hope you guys like it. And, you know, we'll see everybody out on the road.